International and welcome you all to today's sort of Halloween-esque at home but really our theme today is accessories um, and we really feel like it's an overlooked area of dress and textile history it plays such an important role in outfits you know you've got to put a look together what are you going to wear on your head what are you going to wrap yourself up in what are you going to carry in your hand or fan yourself with is what we will discuss and we've got three wonderful speakers today um, I will be acting as host and um, my colleague Hannah Rumble will be acting as question master and then we've got Suzanne nobly running Twitter and trying to capture some highlights from papers on our Twitter stream. Um, as I said, we've got three speakers and the first speaker today is Lucy McConnell. And Lucy is a dress and textile historian with specialisms in textiles produced in Paisley, Scotland in the 18th and 19th century and the British government's utility clothing scheme during the Second World War. And she's currently undertaking a PhD with the University of Huddersfield in England, for those of you who don't know where Huddersfield is. Um, within her research, um, Lucy seeks to unearth the hidden histories of individuals and groups involved in the manufacture and sale of garments and textiles through exploring the social, cultural, political, economic and technological histories embedded within written records and imbued in the material culture of extant garments. Through her research interests ranging from the 18th century to the present day, Lucy's worked on several projects from exhibitions and archiving to written publications, conference presentations and guest lecturing. She's even advised on historical costumes for television. Uh, but today she's going to be discussing the Paisley Shawl, the ultimate accessory of the 19th century. So I'm going to hand over to you, Lucy, and we look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much, Veronica. I'll just share screen there hopefully you can all see that okay brilliant uh, so firstly thank you all for inviting me here today i'm really excited and as you can probably hopefully see behind me um i've got a few shawls which hopefully we'll get to have a bit of a look at later on um at the end of the presentation but here we are the paisley shawl which i believe is one of the most memorable iconic accessories of the 19th century. So originally produced in Kashmir, India, what we know today as the Paisley shawl was adopted into Western fashion during the 18th century. The quality and expense of these shawls adorned with patterns in the form of the pine that we now know as Paisley was a shape evolved from per Persian symbolism of ancient spiritual beginnings which made them desirable throughout, the, throughout all circles, no matter of your class. This led to manufacturer shawls in imitation of cashmere originals in Europe, which, which could be purchased by the new affluent middle classes. The production of imitation shawls was founded on the desire to exploit Western fashion markets, which expanded significantly in the years following the arrival of cashmere shawls in Europe in the second half of the 18th century. Prior to imitation shawls being manufactured in Paisley, they were produced in Lyon, France, Norwich, England, and Edinburgh, Scotland. However, the most sought after examples of shawls remained originals produced in Kashmir. The fine quality of such beautiful garments as Kashmir produced shawls continued to fetch huge sums. Though comparable in appearance, European imitations, which began to be manufactured from around the 1770s, were produced using vastly different methods. They were woven as a whole textile rather than smaller pieces which were later sewn together. Early copies were renowned for their quality, but differed not only in production techniques, but also the colour of threads used, more subdued in the imitation shawl than the brightly coloured Indian textile. This difference in colour illustrates adaptations made to shawls in order to increase their appeal on the European market. European imitations of cashmere shawls could be reeled as such by feeling the fabric, woven mostly of sheep's wool rather than the fine cashmere goat's hair as the original shawl was. The methods employed by weavers in the West reduced costs of production and time required to create the textile, therefore savings were passed on to the buyer. Imitation shawls produced in Europe brought with them a sense of national pride for the wearer. Through the 18th and 19th centuries, products of all kinds made in and imported from Asia were highly desired by consumers in the West, a fashion which coincided with an increase in the desire for goods made at home, resulting in associations of national identity with ownership of British and French made goods. 
shawls made in these centres were deemed enviable due to such associations of national identity in wearing one. As the market for shawls grew, it is said that Edinburgh manufacturer named Patterson approached Paisley Weavers in 1805, seeking assistance to fulfil orders. From here, the shawl was adopted to Paisley's looms, soon becoming for a time the main textile produced in Paisley. And Paisley would soon overtake other centres in shawl manufacture, with many textile producers relocating to the town to take advantage of the fashion for shawls, as Paisley had several advantages, reduced costs, good transport links, and of course, the ability of the weavers. The long held status of the Paisley weaver as adaptable to new products and ingenious in making adaptations to their looms to accommodate new textiles is highlighted by their long standing connection to textile manufacture. Linen, muslin, and silk gauze were manufactured here prior to the shawl, with Paisley silks gaining the town international acclaim in the years before the arrival of the shawl here. As a result, the shawl would become so connected to Scotland's largest town that it would come to be known as the Paisley Shawl the world over. The Paisley Weaver's reputation going before them, their radical nature was exemplified not only in early shawl designs, but also their practicing of poetry, politics, and early trade unionism. Throughout the history of shawl manufacturing Paisley, the industry encountered several trade fluctuations, as well as countless changes in systems of production. The most impactful to the weaver status being the introduction of subsidiary trades, dividing the processes of production into different stages, um, made up of different artisanal roles and introducing managers to the system, further influencing the notoriety of the radical political nature of Paisley weavers, most memorably in the small shot dispute of 1856. Sources from the period reveal the popularity of both cashmere originals and paisley produced imitations. In women's fashion, commenting on the apparent passion for shawls among all women everywhere, while also reporting that the fashionable elite still held the highest regard for originals made in cashmere due to the quality and price commanded for the garment. Cashmere shawls are reported to have been priced up to hundred pounds, considerably, considerably substantial sum whereas Paisley imitations would fetch as little as 10 guineas, which is one pound and one shilling in 1818. Nevertheless, it must be considered that centers of high fashion were the chief market for the sale of the finest shawls of pine pattern produced in Paisley. Manufacturing technologies in shawl production were continually being developed, commencing with draw loom with harness attachment. The jacquard loom would come into widespread use from around 1840 meaning more intricate patterns covering the whole ground of the shawl could be attempted. And I've just illustrated here with a few different examples through this period as well of woven shawls. Printed shawls began to be manufactured in Paisley around 1850. Originally, inked printing blocks were applied to fine woven silks, as can be seen in um, the first two pictures here, as well as wool and wool silk blends, as the wearer is um, showing in the last picture there. The attention to detail on these early examples of printed shawls, alongside the materials onto which inks were applied, show how printed shawls were originally intended for sale at the higher end of the market. However, soon printing began to be applied to cheaper cottons in order to expand market reach. This was of huge detriment to the Paisley shawl industry, as Paisley's cotton mill girls were finally able to acquire a Paisley shawl, though this served as a disadvantage to costly woven shawl industry in the long term. In what is now seen as an attempt to save the wool, the wool woven shawl industry, the reversible shawl was developed in 1865. The beautiful patterns decorating this type of shawl were now visible on both sides, meaning the wearer could fashion and fold their shawl in a variety of ways, something which couldn't really be done before. The pine pattern shawl was a highly desirable garment in Western fashion from the late 18th century and remained a prominent feature of life for most of the 19th century. Following the worst depression in the shawl trade between 1841 and 1843, Queen Victoria purchased 17 shawls in aims of reinvigorating the trade. As a leader of fashion whose style was emulated throughout the country and the world, the efforts of the Queen were a success and the shawl was once again the height of fashion for some years to come further reinforcing the prominence of the pine pattern shawl as an emblem of Victorian life. 
The Paisley shawl held its place in fashion until the 1870s, positioning the decorative textile as one of the most sought after accessories across the globe during its time in fashion. And there are also um, records in vogue from the 1910s, early 1910s of people refashioning shawls or even wearing the shawl as it was originally seen rather than cutting it up, which was eventually seen as um, detrimental to remembering the impact of the shawl in fashion, which is just absolutely fascinating. Um, and just to finish off, if I can come out of here, I have got um, a couple of shawls on hand to show you close up. Um, again, the ones behind this, there's so many, and these are all from um, the collection of the Small Shot Cottages, which is in Paisley and somewhere that I've volunteered for six years now. Um, so we're very, very lucky to have these at home today, <laughs> um, but they're all part of a handling collection, so we can use them a little bit differently. Um, so some that I've picked out are probably my favourite ones. And this one, I know a few of you have probably seen before. Um, and this is it folded probably about one sixth of the size that it actually is. But this is a plain scented um, woven shawl that's got a silk warp and a wool weft. Um, and that means that they could put what we see as the paisley pine nowadays, um, which is decorated with floral forms. And this one dates from the 1840s, more specifically 1841 to 1845, because of the bright red color that was in fashion um, at that time, particularly in terms of shawls. Um, and then I've got one that I've recently acquired for my own collection, which I'm finally thr thrilled to have a Paisley made shawl. Um, and this is a printed shawl. And so it's a big square. It's probably about 60 inches wide. Um, so that's it, about a quarter size. And it's printed onto a really fine wool. Um, and you can see the quite elongated patterns on that one. So that one, yeah, that one dates from about 1850 to 1870s. And it's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> and then lastly, um, there's another one from the Smart Shot Cottages here. And this is a reversible shawl. So dating from 1865 to 1870s when the shawl, shawl trade um, eventually went out of Paisley. Um, and as you can see, it's quite orange in color with greens onto it, which seems to be something that was in fashion for quite a long time. Um, but yeah, the, the other side means that you can wear it either way around. And it's square in shape rather than the earlier rectangles um, as the, the red one was. So they folded it differently, styled it differently with the changing in shapes and styles of skirts with that one. So yeah. <laughs> I think that's about it but thank you so much and any questions <laughs> that was fantastic thank you so much I loved seeing thank the initials at the end um oh, I have, gosh, I have a, a quick question about the first one that you held up the, the extremely yes. large one um yes. what did they envisage the use of having it that large for because obviously a smaller shawl you could you could imagine that that was that was kind of like um you know, dictated by the size of the body and the, the amount of width, but but something that extremely large, kind of how would they envisage them using it? So they're probably, um, this one's probably about, it's over six foot in length. So that sort of shows you how big um, yeah. it actually is. And they would have folded them in different ways um, for the, the extra layers in winter. Um, but also the fashioning, so the crinoline coming into fashion, so you could drape it and display, display the shawl in a different way. Um, specifically with this one, which is a jacquard woven one with the pattern covering the complete, um, the complete round of that shawl. Um, so yeah, really different ways of folding to show the different fashions. So you may have something for a long time, but you could keep up with fashion by folding it differently. Oh yeah, keeping warm in winter as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's brilliant. I hadn't really thought about either of those things. Okay, so we've got a few questions in the chat. So the first is from um, Kimberly Wall, and she has asked, um, I'm wondering to what degree the European demand prior to widespread manufacture in the West had on the, um, had, sorry, had an impact on the styles, colours and or production of the shawls in India? Ooh, so 
prior to arrival. Yeah, so kind of the, the cashmere yeah. shawls, um, yeah. what effect did the European demand have on their styles, their colours mm -hmm. and their production in, in cashmere? Um, so really, colours became more subdued, whereas earlier they were made, obviously, for the, the Indian market. Um, originally, they would have been worn by elite kind of royalty level um, in India. Um, so yeah, as it, it trickled down and being imitated in Europe, European shawls would have been different in colour, different in shape and pattern and things like that. So India definitely started to produce along those lines. Mm. Um, but Kashmiri shawls took several years to produce um, because of the way that they were made, um, embroidery and things like that were applied there. Um, so yeah, it did definitely take the wind out of the sails of the the Indian industry because they were able to produce. It was hand weaving, but in such a different way in Europe that usurped <laughs> the industry mm. in Kashmir really, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting, thank you. Um, I have a question about um, the, the decision to make them, uh, make the pattern on both sides. I'm just wondering whether that did kind of successfully save the, the shawl or whether actually the association with lower classes had kind of done too much damage already? The other thing that started to happen, um, which I probably should have mentioned, was the change in shape of women's fashion. So the bustle skirt coming in um, and that was seen as more suited to shorter jackets and little capelet type things rather than the huge expanse of a shawl covering that. Um, so yeah, several several different factors coming in, obviously accessibility to different products, the trickle down type thing in fashion, um, changing shapes, changing styles. And because it had been in fashion for such a long time as well, I think these things just eventually go out, don't they? And then the several years later, them coming back in. And obviously now we we have the, the Paisley pattern as it's known on so many different things. Um, and Lauren spot in her, little pashmina today <laughs> it's still so iconic and it's nice that it's it's kept that in a way and um a lot of people remember it for the huge thing that it was but it is to an extent forgotten where it originated and there's a place called paisley as well so oh. lucky to live here <laughs> yes indeed uh, let's have a look. Um, so Robin's asked about the conditions of the shawls that you showed us. So obviously they look amazing from here. Are they actually in quite good condition? They are. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the red one is in pristine condition. There's no holes or anything um, on that one. Probably this one that sat behind me here, that does have a few tears in it. Um, and then there's one that has two different coloured centres and that was something that came about to sort of show that you had two shawls or mm. give the impression that you had two shawls and that one's obviously been worn a lot um, that has several holes in it but most of them are in pretty good condition I'd say the of the printed shawls from the cottages the one that has um, silk and wool blends the tassels are made of silk and they're starting to drop off because they've That's perished insane, yeah. really yeah which is a yeah. shame um and then the one that i just acquired does have you're so lucky that is beautiful oh my gosh i know um <laughs> so I'll, I'll let you in on a secret ebay <laughs> <laughs> it was um 20 pound on ebay wow. and not <laughs> um yeah it does have a few dams in it but they're not really noticeable and i think they're original really um, and that adds to the story of the shawl doesn't it yeah. someone loved it Definitely. enough to do that um, so, we, so i'll just um i'll go with one more question um grace has asked um you showed a kirking shawl are these always a blue color like that um, so the ones that I've seen, they all have the white center. So for wearing to church, um, but the ones I've seen, there's reds and pinks as well, um, but they tend to be earlier ones. So the, the size, they're much more the rectangular shape and the huge over six foot. Um, but blues, pinks and reds are the ones that I've seen. I've not really seen any other colors though, but there are a few different colors though. Cool, that's good to know. Thank you. Uh, Thank so one you. final comment rather than a question. Stephanie Richards has said, come to Sussex and visit me at Henfield Museum and have a look at the shawls in the collection. I'd love to know what you think. 
Thank you very much, Lucy. And <laughs> um, I'll pass back to Veronica for our next speaker. Brilliant. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Lucy, for a fantastic start to this afternoon. Um, it's fitting that the last question came from Grace Evans because I forgot to say um, when I started, we are having our next Museum Five Minutes today and Grace will be finishing, finishing things off by talking about Chertsey and, and fittingly also Stephanie, who invited Lucy to Henfield, started off our Museum Five Minutes. So we're hoping to incorporate lots of discussion of museum collections in these conversations going forward. Um, but to turn to our second speaker of today, our next speaker is Robin Calvert. Um, and Dr. Robin Calvert um, is a cultural historian with research interests focused on the history of art, architecture and design in Britain. She has researched and lectured in heritage, architecture and design history and theory at Glasgow School of Art, and is also a visiting lecturer in dress history at the University of Glasgow. She received the Passold Fund PhD bursary for her thesis, Fashioning the Artist, Artistic Dress in Victorian Britain, 1848 to 1900. And she's currently completing a new history of the Macintosh building at Glasgow School of Art to be published by Yale University Press in 2022. Today, however, she's going back to her interest in artistic dress and will be discussing um, an artistic fan in Victorian society. So I'm turning things over to you, Robin. Thank you, Veronica. We've introduced each other so much lately and I'm very <laughs> so you probably have that memorized. Um, so I am excited to talk about this uh, amazing fan today. This is a piece of research that's that's actually many years behind me now. Um, and I love to drag out every now and then because I, I want to get back to it so much. Um, and in fact, I'm going to give a shout out to Caroline Holler, who's in the audience today, because she's writing her master's thesis on this right now. And it's so exciting to know somebody else's um, is diving in and she's doing some really interesting research kind of spurring off of what I've done. And actually, I'm going to put in the chat because what I'm going to talk to you about is a bit of a whistle stop of a longer piece of research, which you can download for free at this link, um, and adding on a little bit more that has been discovered in the ensuing years towards the end. So this fan um, was, uh, it, it, so I'm just going to go through here. So it, it originally um, was made by somebody and we don't know who it is. There's a big mystery around it, which is a lot of fun. So in 1910, it came up for auction as part of this um, collection of a magnificent collection of autograph letters and historical documents, the property of a gentleman. Um, and in, in, the, in the auction catalog, it's basically all paper autographs and then this fan, which is really quite strange. And it lists that, it's, it states that this fan, uh, the contributors to which are the most eminent artists, composers, and musicians of the day, 40 specimens, each signed by the contributor. And then it ends with, this work of art was formed by a lady of exalted rank since deceased. And that's all it says. Um, and, and Sotheby swears that they no longer have the um, original documentation around this sale from 1910. And so no idea whose collection it was and who this exalted lady is. So when um, it basically, the fan came up a year later in the sketch as owned by um, Ernest Brown and Phillips, who were the operators of the Leicester Gallery. Um, whether they purchased it from Sotheby's is unclear, but then thereafter it disappears and remains elusive for 100 years. The only evidence we have that it exists are some photographs I'll show you later. Actually, they were glass plate negatives owned by Whistler of photographs taken by Whistler in the fan when the fan was in his possession and a sketch of the blade by Whistler. And that's here at the University of Glasgow. So that's kind of how it came into my orbit via my connection to um, the Whistler, uh, Whistler research at Glasgow. Um, and I got the opportunity when I was still a PhD student to do research on this for the collector because when this fan resurfaced, um, in late 2009, it came up for auction in New Jersey and everybody was all a flurry. It's one of these lost objects. Oh my God, the fan suddenly has appeared again in New Jersey um, of all places. And the V&A bid on it and Glasgow bid on it and all these people bid on it, but it went to this private collector. And luckily for me, the private collector reached out to Margaret McDonald at University of Glasgow who passed it on to me to do research because I was doing artistic dress at the time. So this was one of those amazing PhD dream moment that things. It didn't quite make it in my thesis, but I got the side gig to research it. And 
the interesting story, I guess, is a him being a collector. Unfortunately, the person who bought it, Steve Banks, is no longer with us. He knew that he had terminal cancer at the time. And he wanted so much to find out who this woman was. So that's kind of what he had asked me to do. And there just hasn't been any evidence to come up with who she is. So there's kind of an interesting story there too around research and collectors. And he had this drive and he was kind of very good at making up narratives about, oh, I bet it was the mistress of the Prince of Wales because of this and that. And as a researcher, I had to be like, well, but mm, she didn't die before 1910, you know, things like that. Um, so what I want to do today is very quickly take you through a little bit around about the history of autograph fans. And by the way, this fan was shown in the 2011 Cult of Beauty exhibition. So some of you may have seen it. Um, and then kind of take you through a little bit more about this fan. So just a little bit on the history and and i'm showing you here um that when it was exhibited in the sketch it was it was said that it was uh put together by walter crane so the peacock feathers that you're seeing painted across all of the blades were painted by crane and he also did the the two end guards um so i call it the crane fan the owners like to call it the fan of lady x um, it's a bit of a mystery, but it's not to Sergeant too, who's on here. And I hope you can see some of the names. This is the um, front of the fan. I had to throw in a picture of Walter Crane because he's my favorite dead boyfriend. He's super dapper. Um, and then what we got when the fan came up for auction that we never saw before was um, the back of the fan, which has the musicians largely musicians and literary figures on it. And you can see it's just an incredible condition. The color on it is absolutely amazing. But to kind of go back, um, autograph fans were popular really since um, around the 18th century. And um, the Fan Museum has several examples of these, um, particularly fans that are signed by royals and dignitaries. Um, this one is in the collection of the Fan Museum. It's, a, it's signed by Jean Eckhart and Emile Zola, among others. Um, and the, this is a, a fan that is like one you most commonly know, which is sticks, which are then put together with silk or paper um, a te or textile or paper. But the majority of the autograph fans that I found, and I found 26 and counting throughout my research, are of this brise variety. A brise fan is the wooden sticks or leaves made, they're usually made of wood, but they can be made from ivory and they provide, I think, a much better surface for painted decoration. Um, so these fans were popular in Britain by 1881 when an item in the comical Penny Press, uh, Funny Folks noted that the new autograph fan is indispensable, a sign qua non in fact. By 1892, Hearth and Home had a more critical view. And they said, everybody's no doubt heard of that terror, the autograph fan, which ladies take to parties and terrify lions with. So you can imagine women running around, I suppose, would you sign my fan? Um, however, in 1889, article on the history of the fan written by the novelist Louisa Parr for Harper's New Monthly takes a more serious look at autograph fans and says that they're a revival of a very old world fashion, specifically from the East. She discusses the Chinese custom of using paper fans as autograph albums, which subsequently become of great value. Later in 1910, the artist and educator George Wollascroft Reed wrote this huge hefty tome, it's literally massive, on the history of the fan, and says that in Japan, fans were passed around at social gatherings, exchanged and carried away as souvenirs of friendly and interesting occasion. So this more artistic type of fan is closer in style to the British autograph fans. I'm just showing you another example of a coronet fan here. Um, and this is of course worth noting as their fan, these fans are a particular trend among the estates who are so enamored with Japan. Um, Louisa Parr uh, illustrates two such fans. Oh, I'm sorry, here's an example of one of those autographed Japanese versions of the fan that's from that text. And then in um, the PAR article, she illustrates two fans by notable aesthetic ladies, Laura Alma Tadema and Kate Lewis, who is the sister of Ellen Terry. There you go, Veronica. Um, the Lewis family home uh, was, especially, was especially well established as an artistic and social salon by the state. 
Um, so here is Mrs. Arthur Lewis's fan, Kate Lewis's fan. It's arranged in what seemed to be the popular fashion of having artists on one side and musicians on the other. Um, the dates are around 1880 to 84, and it includes several contributors who are also on the Crane fan, like Malay, Alma Tadema, Dixie, Du Maurier, Hunter, and Boughton. Um, other, uh, other popular artists of the day, such as Herkimer, and we don't have a picture of the back, but Parr says that it includes Clara Schumann, Rubinstein, and Joachim. So autograph fans were popular within the Terry Lewis women. Kate Lewis's daughter also had fans. Lucy Terry Lewis's fan was auctioned as part of the Forbes collection in 2003 and has an equally impressive list of contributors to it. The decoration is entirely in black ink with the recto filled with artists, including Dixie, the Alma Tadamas, and Lindley Sanborn, and Sargent. While the verso is adorned with autographs of luminaries of the stage in this case, including Ellen Terry and her uncle Fred, who rather inscreetly, is sweetly inscribed, I'll always love you on it. Um, Lucy's sister Mabel also had a fan made later in 1900, which was donated to the Victoria Al and Albert Museum by their nephew, the Sir, late Sir John Gilgood. Um, and those guards also have classical designs that were possibly made by Lawrence um, Alma Tadema. So this is an, an illustration though of Laura Alma Tadema's fan and the Alma Tadema's obviously I've said their name like 12 times already are quite central to this story. Um, Reed in his text actually credits Lady Alma Tadema of reviving the autograph fam in the for form of sign manuals to famous artists and musicians. So, um, it's interesting to consider whether or not she started this trend. And here's actually a photograph of it as well that shows up. And also just from thinking about the way they're made technically, um, which I'm gonna get into ju in just a minute. So you can see on, on oops, Laura Alma Tadema is that there's this soldier that crosses the blades here and that Crane's decoration, which was probably put on at the end kind of crosses over some of the blades as well. So, um, the, the arrangement of these things is quite interesting. And the thing is that these fans can very easily be taken apart and the blades can go around. Um, it can be taken off individually, but it seems in the case of the crane fan, it went around as a, as a whole object because Whistler has it, you'll, as you'll see shortly, he has it with him in Paris um, at the time. But there's one fan that was really interesting that I, I got into when I was looking at these. Um, hang on one second, this one. Uh, is in the Lindley Sanborn house. I don't know if, if anyone's ever seen it, but as you can see, it's massive. It's huge. It's, it's sitting in front of this hearth. It's a, this is a terrible photo I took, but um, studying this fan helped me think about how these things might have been done because I just assumed that you would just have the fan and do something with it. And, and I did learn that you could easily take them apart, but this one was so massive. Luckily, Lindley Sanborn, who was, you know, the illustrator for Punch was quite a great diarist and saved a lot of his letters. And in the collection, um, I was able to go through and basically he sent out these individual blades to his friends with a note saying, could you decorate this for my wife? And then they sent him back and they have a lot of the letters still from this. Um, here's one with a sketch from Story um, where he's like, would this be okay? And then he does it on the fan. And a lot of the artists would write back saying, you know, uh, what's the theme of the fan? Is there one? Would this suit? Would this is, I hope it's okay. And then other things like, sorry, I kept it so long. Like it was, it's just, it's really interesting kind of narrative around doing this. And this fan incidentally was incomplete. Um, it was never finished. And we don't know that it's in its original configuration because the leaves were found just in a drawer. And then um, one of the, the uh, descendants interior designer helped put it back together and put it in this case. But seeing this fan and as well seeing another one that's in the Lindley Sanborn house and this one is just sitting on top of their piano in this case was kind of the aha moment for me to realize that the function of these was not necessarily that they were going around using these fans in public. Obviously some of them are huge, but they're a document. So when you go over to their house, they're like, hey, look who my friends are, basically. It's a, it's a kind of a visual visiting book of the artistic circle that they belong to. It's a representation of their social connections. How am I doing on time? <laughs> You got a few minutes left. 
Cool. Okay. So let's just look a little bit more detail on the crane fan then. So this social connection is the interesting, one of the key interesting things about these objects. It, they represent all uh, connections of all types. So for example, on the crane fan, there's familial connections. Edward Jaburn Jones and his son Philip completed their blades early on. And these are all dated around 1894, 95. I have like a spreadsheet that kind of tries to, I've been trying to like, you know, trace where did it go? What did it, who was it with? Um, Sir Lawrence Almatadema and his wife Laura completed their blades a day apart from each other. The composer Sir Charles Hall Edward Halley and his violinist wife Wil Wilma Halley autographed their blades with musical notations on the same day. The Halleys were close friends and collaborators with the musicians jo Joseph Joachim and, and Ignacy Paderewski. Um, and they're part of this rich musical circle, which included other fan contributors, such as the famous tenor Edward Lloyd, who worked on several occasions with Arthur Sullivan, who's also on this fan. It's like everybody, anybody. So here you go, sorry, here's some of the details of the Alma Tadamas, Leighton, Byrne Jones, Malay. Um, the Halley's son, Charles Edward Halley, also signed his blade on the 7th of November of that year. Um, other people are in there is Kate Perugini. Um, and the circle, of course, was not just limited to London. Paderewski and Joachim both signed that they're in Manchester when they when they when they sign it. And then, of course, as I said before, Whistler signs his. And there's the plate glass negative from. There's a few of these photographs in his collection and the sketch. And he signs that he's in Paris at the time, doing it, as well as Tissot. And Catherine and or Carolyn and I were just yesterday discussing a theory that it may have been Tissot that took it to Paris and took it around with him, but we're not sure. Um, and just kind of again, kind of going through these musical notation is really interesting because the song that is noted here by Arthur Sullivan is actually something that Edward Lloyd sang, who's also on there. And I have amazing fantasies about doing an exhibition that includes musical performances of the piece on the fan someday. That would be the best. Um, and also think people taking things out of paintings. So Laura Almatadema, why this is it is why did they put what they put on the fan? We're not really sure. This is a detail from a lost painting of hers called Fireside Fancies. Why'd she stick a little baby on there? Who knows? So final minutes, Sorry, Robin, thanks. sorry. No, that's good. I told you to do that. This is the final minute. So this is good. I'm just going to flip through. So there's just comparing the Whistler. Um, one of the things we found out from the Whistler is that he rearranged and kind of played with the blades when he had them, obviously. They're in different configurations. In the photographs, that kind of shows that where the Burnt Jones, they're in different positions. But here's where I want to land. Who is Lady X? I already said, we don't know. <laughs> I want it to be Laura Almatadema really badly. She died in 1909. When I went around trying to figure this out, I was like, what does exalted rank mean? Asking me American, asking people what that meant. Everyone said, oh, she must be really high rank like a duchess, but apparently it's just titled. So Laura's got a title. I want it to be her, but it didn't make sense to me that it would immediately get auctioned off after her death, like a year later with, with her family. And she was very close to her stepdaughter. I just didn't think. So it still remained a mystery. And I was doing a lot of kind of like making spreadsheets, looking at all the women with titles who were showing up at the new gallery and at the Grosvenor gallery and, and finding out when they died. So I have like a spreadsheet of dead women trying to figure out like, could it be them? But a couple of years ago, and this is where I'm wrapping up and leaving it here, a couple of years ago, um, sorry, I, there we go. Um, I had always thought that there, some of the, the illustrations might look like portraits of whoever this was. So you kind of, it's hard not to make up narratives with this. These two kind of look alike by, uh, by Collier and Alma Tadema. A couple of years ago, Simon Toll, who is a, the head of Victorian stuff, I think, at Sotheby's, <laughs> wrote a book on Frank Dixie. And in this book, he the email came to me that he was looking for an image of the fan, because in the book, he was basically saying that the fan belonged to Lady Jean Palmer. I was like, okay, how'd you come up with that? And he, he'd written at first that he found the auction catalog that it was noted by Palmer. And I was like, that's really interesting. I have been trying to get this. And then he wrote back and said, oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I was thinking of a different object. I can't really recall how I came up with it, but he gave me this sort of list of why he thought it was her. 
And it all kind of ties together. And the biggest one was that this is a portrait of her by Frank Dixie, but there's still no evidence. Sorry, Simon Toll, he had no smoking gun for this. He just has a list of, I think, and it could be as good as anybody else. So I'm just leaving you with this. I mean, kind of looks like her, sure. Here's Laura Alma-Tadema. We all know that these men like to paint their heavy-jawed women kind of all looking alike anyway, because women are generic and interchangeable for Victorian men artists, right? Um, but, you know, I don't know if it's her. But anyway, we did have a session. Veronica actually joined me where we met the descendant of Lady Jean Palmer. And he, in his, I guess her sister collected a lot of fans. She's as good as anybody but well, we still don't have the evidence. So I always like to leave it out there. So I'll stop there with my whirlwind thing. Thank you, Robin. Um, so with, I'm gonna be quick with the questions. Yeah. Um, so there are there are a few, so maybe you wanna go and chat afterwards and have a little look. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, oh, what have we got? What have we got? Oh, sorry, that moved. Um, so Emily Taylor has asked whether the fan featured in Country Life and or Tatler and she said, I'm thinking there must be correspondence noting the return of some completed leaves somewhere. Nope. No. Nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. So I actually have a question about the kind of the women who would have been able to make these fans. I'm imagining that this was kind of only the practice of upper class women who had access to these kinds of people of note, or actually were they more accessible than I'm thinking? Um, no, it's a, it's a really good question. The fans themselves are very accessible. The objects themselves, you can buy a blank fan from any fan maker, actually. And then if you want to hang around outside the dressing room of people like they do today, probably the same situation. Um, so, but in terms of getting this, yes, hand painted, hey pal, Whistler Sergeant, Malay, Burn Jones, would you paint my fan? Yeah. And I, this is why I think Laura Alma Tadema, like for me, I thought it was going to be the wife of an artist or somebody too. Mm. Um, but they do have to be very well connected. And Jean Palmer was, and in fact, there's other connections to like Theodora Gleichen. She had a, she was friends and had a sculpture made by her as well. So there are connections there, but it's, yeah, it's gotta be somebody who's hanging around in the either Holland Park, St. John's Wood kind of clique of people for this one. Cause the, and that Crane put it together for her, whoever she is. Yeah. In the she end, like, like let me arrange it and make it beautiful. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's a question here from Miriam. She asks, uh, were fans made by enterprising sellers specifically for people collecting autographs? Um, I, yeah, uh, I think that blank fans were made more generally for people to decorate. Um, so you could buy a blank paper or, or silk or wooden to have painted. And there's wonderful decorations and sketches for fans in the fan museum by like Matisse and, you know, things like that as well. So they, to get, getting a blank fan doesn't seem to be that difficult a thing, however you want to use it in the end. Cool. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat about the, what the fan is made from and whether they were ever featured in kind of performances or portraits, but I'll leave you to go and have a little rummage for those. And I'll pass back to Veronica for our next speaker. Thanks. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you, Robin. Um, so much food for thought already today, um, but we still have appetite for our final speaker, who is Lauren Martin. Um, and Lauren is a theatrical milliner, an independent researcher based in Nottingham, UK. In addition to making hats and head headwear, she also lectures on the BA One's costume design and making course at Nottingham Trent University. And in 2021, really impressive year <laughs> to, to sort of complete anything, um, she completed an MA by research at the University of Huddersfield on the topic of milliners and millinery in the 1830s. And she's going to be talking to us today about the early Victorian bonnet, Makers, Methods and Materials. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Veronica. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming today. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak. I'm really honored and pleased to be here. Um, apologies in advance. I've had a head cold for the past three weeks and my voice is a bit in and out. So I've got water, I've got cough sweets, but if I suddenly drop out, that's why. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. And hopefully you can all see that now. Okay. <clears throat> so 
So here we are. And as Veronica said, I'm talking about um, the early Victorian bonnet and the dates I'm going to be talking about are kind of loosely 1835 to 1860. Um, so that's the time period I'm going to cover. And as Veronica mentioned, I'm a costume maker and a milliner. Uh, so my talk and my research that I'm hoping to share with you today absolutely has more of a practical focus um, because that's what I do. I make things, it's my main source of income. Um, I do also lecture and as I said, I do the research too, but my hands um, make my money. So all my research is, is trying bits, it's getting into fabric and needles and thread and putting things together um, and doing things that way. I do care about the, you know, um, the people who wore the bonnets, et cetera, et cetera. But um, as you'll see through the next three slides, um, I'm, I'm focusing on making. Uh, so yeah, just a bit about me. I won't go into too much detail because Veronica's covered it already. This is my little millinery studio in Nottingham. And um, my background, as she said, was in costume making, um, but I also do lecture and now um, I'm a theatrical milliner. Um, <clears throat> so to share my research today, I'm sharing these bonnets first. Um, the one on the right in all these images, the brown one, is an extant 1830s bonnet. I've dated it to about 1825, 1835. Um, the one on the left is the reproduction that I made. And how it came about was, um, I was on maternity leave actually, and you get a lot of spare time holding a sleeping baby um, with one hand free to look on your phone and Etsy and eBay are absolutely dangerous, so it's Amazon too. Um, for spending all your um, maternity pay um, on stuff. And I saw this bonnet on Etsy. It was photographed completely wrong, but I could see that it was really, really old. I wasn't searching for a bonnet. I didn't need a bonnet, um, but it was affordable and I bought it and it arrived. And as you can see, it's in pretty good condition. It's not in perfect condition, um, but considering its age, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's in pretty good shape. What... I was really keen to, um, you know, do was, you know, keep it intact, but I couldn't stretch out the brim as much as it, you know, should have been stretched out. Um, and so I couldn't see what the bonnet looked like when it was new. Whoever ordered this bonnet, whoever made this bonnet, you know, what did it look like in 1830, we'll say, you know, when it came out of the shop. So I thought, right, well, how do I find out what the bonnet looked like new? I'll, I'll make one. It was, you know, I didn't really think about it. I just went and got some paper and started taking a pattern um, and found some fabric that would suit and just started making one. And I've looked back at the pictures I took of the making process to figure out how long it took me. Um, and because I was still on maternity leave, it was just like nap times that I could grab here, there and everywhere. I think I worked on it for about three months. So at about, you know, two, two hours max at a time, just figuring out how the bonnet was made, um, which resulted in, in these bits of, Put a few images in here. This is the digitized pattern that I've since made from my original paper pattern. Um, but it's kind of showing the research that I did on the bonnet and that I want to do on other bonnets. Because when I found this bonnet, my, you know, when you find a, a piece of period clothing, um, a lot of people, you know, their go-to books are going to be, you know, Nora War or Janet Arnold or anything like that, so that you can kind of date your garment by seeing the pattern shapes. <laughs> Um, you know, the skirt shapes, the bodice shapes, the sleeves. So I wanted to go look for the, the book of hats that had, you know, the shapes for my bonnet. And there is no book. And especially not for a bonnet like this. I couldn't find anything um, that was easily available. I've since found one book on drawn bonnets, but it concentrates mostly on like 1850s, 1860s. Um, there's no pattern out there for an 1830s drawn bonnet. Um, the drawn bonnet, I'll just clarify here, um, is opposed to say like a buckram bonnet, which is just like a flat brim that's covered in fabric, or a straw bonnet, which is sewn out of straw braid where the, they're all sewn in rows. The drawn bonnet is a big long piece of fabric and it shares a lot in common with say like a crinoline cage skirt or um, what do you call it, pocket hoops, panniers, where you've got channels sewn and you thread the ribs of whatever you're using. It could be cane, it could be wire in, and then it's drawn up over those ribs to get the shape. So the pattern on the bottom is a big, long, flat piece, um, but it gets drawn up into what you see here. 
so the first images I showed where it showed the finished bonnet alongside the extant, you know, kind of shows very neatly like, oh, look, I got from, you know, the extant to the finished thing, um, but not all the mess in between. And I've got loads of pictures like this of just fabric looking like an absolute mess. Like, what is it doing? Da, 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 da. So it's one thing to take a pattern off a garment, but it's another thing to then go and try to figure out how, how is it made? Um, and my experience in millinery is, is you know, it's, it's pretty reasonable. I worked for um, a really good milliner down in London um, and we worked on some really, you know, extreme hats. So my technical knowledge is pretty, pretty high up. Um, and this bonnet was really difficult to make. So all the while I was making this bonnet, I'm thinking this wasn't a lady sitting at home just doing this, figuring it out for the first time by herself. This person had someone helping her. This, per this was probably made by a professional milliner, not just by, you know, Lydia Bennett sitting at home, you know, pulling things off and da, 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 da. So that got me thinking like, you know, less about the person who bought the bonnet and wore the bonnet, but more about the person who made the bonnet and the people who made the bonnets. So long story short, that led to the MA, which focused on milliners and millinery in 1830s England. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, so once I worked out the construction, there ended up being four bonnets so far. I think I've got one more left in me before I have to put this bonnet away and never do another one again. Um, but the top left one is the first one that um, I trussed up with all sorts of trims that I, I could kind of see, like, you know, my extant bonnet didn't have any trim anymore. What might it have looked like? So I copied a fashion plate and put some stuff on and just, you know, took some pictures. The one next to it, the olive green one, that was a commission, and that's in uh, silk taffeta, and it's using some um, vintage feathers and some really pretty silk fabric as the ribbon. The bottom left one, the blue one, was actually the toile for the olive green one, so that's why it looks a bit wobbly. Um, but I wanted to try it out in a lighter fabric to see if it worked. The red one actually has machine stitching on the ribs rather than hand stitching because I wanted to see if I could do a quicker version that could be sold on my Etsy shop. So the, the hand stitch bonnets take 19 hours start to finish. Um, and the red one I think is about 10 or 11, so it does cut out a lot of time. Um, but that kind of did give me an indication as to, you know, how much these bonnets might have cost. Every stage of the making, I was thinking about all these things, you know, that you don't find in the books or that aren't in any books yet, you know, like, okay, it's taken me 20 hours to do it. Would it have taken the professional mill in the 20 hours to do it? How many different people were working on it? Could you cut it down to one day by having, you know, Sarah doing this bit and Jane doing this bit and Elizabeth doing the other and then, you know, hey, presto, the bonnet's finished. So um, those were the sorts of, you know, questions that were coming up as I was making it. And it was just fascinating um, because I hadn't really kind of set out to, to find out that kind of stuff, but... I just want to know more now. Um, and so I bought more bonnets. Um, it's like Lucy on eBay finding her shawl. Um, if you search eBay and Etsy a lot, they do come up. And I've got a rule that I won't spend more than a hundred pounds on something just because I think, you know, it's, you've got to have a limit. If you don't have a limit, you could, you know, Augusta auctions, you could spend like, you know, half a year's pay on something amazing. Um, but what it kind of results in is that I've got this collection of not pristine bonnets. Some are a bit battered, some are lovely, some are not. But they're also probably not like the elite wear bonnets. They're probably like, you know, not working women, but more middle-class, probably someone more aligned to, you know, say my status in society. So, you know, I'm not super wealthy, but I'm not super poor. What would I have worn? What could I afford, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the best thing about it is um, they're my bonnets and I can kind of touch them and poke them and see them whenever I want. So as lovely as it is, um, and as fortunate as we are in this country here to have so many museums and so many collections of so many beautiful things. Um, I did manage to visit three collections uh, whilst doing my MA. I went to the VNA, I went to Leicestershire, and I went somewhere else and I can't remember where it was. Um, oh, Nottingham, Nottingham City Gallery, so at Newstead Abbey. So I managed to see three collections before COVID hit and you weren't allowed to go see anything anymore. Um, but so that kind of led to me buying more stuff because 
it was lovely. Um, but I, at the VA, for instance, all the bonnets are presented face down on the table on little padded stands, and you're not allowed to pick them up. And the um the, the people assisting you at the VA aren't allowed to pick them up either. So um, there were seven bonnets on a table and I could only see the back. I couldn't see the underside of the brim. I couldn't see the inside of the crown. I thought, well, this is this is lovely. They're so pretty. But if they're there for research and researchers can't get in to see them, you know, why, why are they even there in storage and why, you know, it's not like I wanted to put it on and jam it, da, 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 but um, you can learn so much as a makeup by looking inside the bonnet and I couldn't so I got really frustrated so I bought more of my own and um, I can do what I like with them I'm not rough I'm not horrible but um, as you can see here I've, I've got plans to do other bonnets and the one that I think appeals to me most to do next is this one this one was an eBay find I think it's about 50 pounds and it's silk and it is almost brand new it is in such pristine condition I almost feel like it hasn't been worn um, it's really really beautiful and I've just shown a few of the detailed pictures here for all the stuff that you can see inside when you are allowed to pick up the bonnets and poke around a bit um, you can see that the ribbons are pinned on so I'm never going to remove those pins just because I think I like the idea that, you know, there's ghost hands that have pushed those pins in and I'm not going to remove them, you know, I'm not going to um, destroy that bit of history. I can see enough, you know, around the pins, um, you know, to kind of get an idea of what's going on. And also the handwriting on the back of the buckram there in the crown. I haven't, I, when I bought the bonnet, I kind of looked at it for maybe, you know, 20 minutes, took some pictures and then it's gone back in its box and I've been so busy, I haven't been able to get back to see you know to revisit it properly so I haven't figured out exactly what five and a half means is it five and a half inches is it da, 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 but you know solving little mysteries like that um you know is what I'm looking forward to doing the picture actually makes it look like it's a bit two-tone like the ribbon on the outside is brown and the, the fabric is black but it's actually completely black and it's funny um when Lucy was showing her shawls earlier um, this bonnet is from the same era, I think, as the shawls. And you can imagine a lady who might be wearing a plainish dress, maybe brown or green or something like that, putting on a bonnet, um, you know, put on a shawl like this with that garment. And you've got, you don't need an extravagant bonnet because you've got this lovely, you know, ruched satin with a gorgeous shawl or something setting it off. Um, and the accessories, you know, are going to look more than maybe the dress as you're walking down the street or going to church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it was really lovely to see Lucy's shawls and get an idea of what the other accessories were of the period. Because, I mean, I wear scarves and shawls all the time. I wear hats in winter. Um, but if you looked in my wardrobe, just at my clothes, you wouldn't get an idea of what I look like every day just by looking at my blouses and shirts and jeans. Um, I'm definitely more about, you know, my, my shawls and what's going around on my head. Um, if I don't do that one next, I'm going to do this one next. And um, this one is in reasonable condition, um, considering, you know, uh, the silks, the silk is decaying in bits. You can kind of see that it's, it's shattering a bit. You can see that's got, it's got one surviving string and that one's pinned in as well. But this one was sent to me from a lovely lady in America who saw, this is the magic of Instagram. I was posting pictures of bonnets I was making. She saw the pictures and said, I've got a bonnet, want it? Well, like, yeah. <laughs> so she said, just uh, cover the cost of postage and I'll send it to you. So she did. And I waited. It came from America. I was expecting a box. I was not expecting it to come through my letterbox. And it did in an envelope. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's no wire in this one around the outside of the brim. It's all cane. So it arrived flat. And um, um, even though it, it did, you know, um, get to me through my letterbox, it's in remarkable condition. Um, aside from that fact so this will probably be the next one I do and they are all drawn bonnets so they are kind of variations on that 1830s theme with the ruching and the detail but as I said there's no books um, that have this kind of detail in yet and so that's basically I think my next slide oh no the slide after um, I'll just mention briefly um, I do consider all my bonnets as kind of working tools um, when you go to museums, you don't necessarily get to try them on. Um, I do try on all my bonnets if they fit. 
I make sure I've got clean hair and I'm very, very careful and I don't wear them for very long. I wouldn't lend them to somebody to wear out, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't get an idea of what it's like to wear it unless you actually wear it. You get a real sense of the weight of them. None of them are heavy. They are all really, really light. If you're going out and you're wearing a bonnet all day, you don't want this big, heavy thing on your head. You want it to be, you know, light and not interfere with, you know, your day to day. Um, you know, your day to day business, you don't want to be aware of it, I'm constantly adjusting it. Um, and so that's what I immediately felt, you know, as soon as I put all the bonnets on. So sorry if there's any curators here who are kind of going, oh my God, what's she doing putting the bonnets on? Um, for me, it's a really important part of, you know, figuring out, you know, how to make the reproductions. Um, but this again is more of my inspiration. When I went looking for patterns, I wanted something on the level of this. To me, this is such an important benchmark of what, you know, um, my costume work and all my making work, you know, just to see all the patterns laid out on grids and then see how they correspond, you know, with a line drawing of the garment for me as a maker is, you know, is the zenith of what I'd like to achieve, you know, with the bonnet patterns. I mean, does the world need books about bonnets? Probably not. But at the same time as a maker, I look through each and every one of these books and I will probably not make any of the things in these, you know, for the rest of my career, but that doesn't matter. I like looking at the pictures to see how they're made, to see how they correspond. And that's what's interesting to me. So if there was something to do with bonnets out there, um, I don't think it would be necessarily a bad addition to, you know, to dress history publications. It's, it's a one day thing and I'd be more than happy to collaborate with other makers and other dress historians, you know, on this. It's just there is a bit of a gap. There's lots of books with pictures of the bonnets, but no patterns um, and how they're made. When I'm finished with Victorian bonnets, I've, I've begun buying late Victorian ones, too. So, you know, it's um, it's. I've got, I've got a lot of work lined up. I, I realise that this is going to take me, you know, decades and I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. When I finish late 19th century, I've got a box of Edwardian and 20s and that's probably where I'll stop. So, yeah, I'll stop sharing. Oh, that's the wrong one. Thank you so much, Lauren. That is absolutely amazing. I think all of us are going to be heading straight for eBay after this, after Lucy's shawl and your bonnets. Um, I'm definitely going to be going and having a rummage on there now. OK, so we've got time for a couple of questions before we move over to make sure that Grace has some time to chat about the museum. So I'll just pick a couple from the chat. Um, if you scroll back, there's loads of really nice comments. So you'll have to have to come in and have a little look. Um, so Jackie Jacobs has asked, do you find that most of these bonnets have ribbons that are pinned in or are they stitched on? Um, uh, not all of my bonnets have ribbons. Um, I think the majority that do have them are pinned on. And I think the ones that where there's just one straggly bit of ribbon left, it may be stitched, but it doesn't always look like original stitching. And you can't always tell whether it is the original ribbon. And I think people interchange them anyway, hence the pinning. So um, yeah, I'd say more pinned. And at the VA, there were lots of pins. It's it's really common to see them pinned. Thank you. Um, Robin has asked, um, am I correct in thinking you would be able to buy a blank bonnet, a bit like a blank fan that you could redecorate? As in back in the day, back in the 18. Yeah. Um, it depends, I think, maybe on the on the milliners and their shops and whether they were happy to have, you know if they made a blank bonnet and somebody went out and decorated it really terribly, their name technically may still be attached to the bonnet, so they may not want to, you know, but um, like Lydia Bennett does in Pride and Prejudice, she sees a, a bonnet in a shop and she's like, oh, it's, it's hideous, but I'm going to take it apart and make it better. So you probably bought a cheap one and did it up that way or, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So um, I haven't found evidence for finished bonnets, but definitely bonnet parts maybe for other milliners to, you know, buy and then do up to selling their shops. Interesting. Um, and just one final one, uh, Jennifer Millen has asked, what sources are you consulting to date the bonnets? Um, mostly museum websites, if I'm honest, um, just because they've got the best pictures and you can zoom in and they, you get an overview, you know, you can look at a hundred different bonnets and go, okay, 
80% of them are saying this day, et cetera, et cetera. There's a couple of books I've got that have got pictures. Um, there are, there's an amazing book, um, School of Historical Dress, just recently published on headwear. That's really, really good. But there's lots of gaps and yeah, not, not that many books. <laughs> Uh, like I said, there's loads of really nice comments and questions in the chat, so do go and have a look at that, um, but I will pass back to you, Veronica. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, a headline for you, Lauren, the books, a plural, are in, in high demand. You, you go through the chat and say, yes, 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 yes to the book. Um, so whilst you enjoy that, that enthusiasm and appetite for what you will no doubt be bringing to the dress history community, I'm going to turn over to Grace, who is our second Museum 5 Minutes guest. Grace Evans is the Keeper of Costume at Chertsey Museum, um, and she's going to be telling us about Fashioning a Century, an introduction to the 19th century dress holdings of the Olive Matthews Collection at Chertsey Museum. So I'm going to let you share your screen and your treasures with us, Grace, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you, Veronica. Um, Veronica knows the collection very well because she actually did um, cover my maternity leave when I was... Um, uh well we're having my second child so um i i think uh, she's probably quite capable of telling you all about the collection as well but anyway here i am um so let me start with a little picture of the museum itself um here is chertsey museum it's in a regency townhouse in chertsey in surrey um, and it has local history collections and it is also the home of the Olive Matthews collection. And there's Olive Matthews herself um, back in 1972 when the museum opened with her dress items in it. Um, so the Olive Matthews collection consists of over 6,000 items of men's, women's and children's dress and accessories. And the earliest piece is about 1600. Um, and the latest is about 2010, so uh, it's quite a, a broad collection. Um, and the core of the collection was put together by this lady, Olive Matthews, and she was a self-taught collector who had an extraordinary, very good eye, I would say. Um, and she was particularly interested in pieces from the 18th and early 19th century. And she was interested in very fine craftsmanship. Um, so that those were her kind of um, main things that she, she was keen on. And I think she was interested also in the same way that the members of the art, arts and crafts movement were interested in fine craftsmanship and sort of retaining that for posterity. I think that was a, another factor in her collecting. So, um, she began her collection when she was a young girl and she was given a small allowance by her father and she used to regularly visit antique stalls at the old Caledonian Road Market in Camden Town where she lived and um, she was ahead of her time in valuing and collecting dress. Um, so she was, as I said, particularly interested in 18th and early 19th century and we've just got a little group of items there up on the screen of examples of the sorts of things that she collected. I, I'm glad that I put a shawl in <laughs> and um, she has over 900 items of lace in the collection, some of which are very beautiful early items. Um, we've got a Tudor nightcap there as well, which um, is very, very special. Uh, and 18th century holdings are very good too. Um, and here's some more of the 19th century pieces. So a trust was created to support the collection during the 1960s, and this formed a partnership with the local authority. And as I said, Chertsey Museum opened in 1972, and luckily Miss Matthews was there to see it open. And since then, successive curators have added to the collection, uh, bringing it up to date. And significantly for this presentation, we've acquired um, more important mid to later 19th century pieces, which were originally not really part of the collection. So since we don't have very much time this afternoon, I'm just going to give you a whistle stop tour of some of our 19th century pieces. And I'm just gonna show you them in chronological order. So obviously these ones you're seeing in front of you are um, accessories and smaller items, but I'm going to focus more on full garments for you. So just to start off, um, we've got a white muslin gown dating between 1810 and 1815. And um, it's not the kind of true 
ancient Greek revival style. It's more into the historicism period of fashion that happened in that era. And um, you've got an example here of a sort of 19th century attempt to recreate Tudor slashed garments, which I think is fascinating. But because it's the 19th century, they're beautifully stitched and uh, there's piping around those puffs, which um, is nothing like the Tudor slashed look, but still quite interesting. And then at the back, you can see that at this piece is no longer exhibiting the kind of apron front um, style that you have in the early 1800s. It's more the the um, the drawstring at the back. So it's simplified the the fastenings at the back. Then this is a great favourite with many people from our collection, and this is a beautiful pink silk Spencer from about 1915. Uh, sorry, 1815. Um, and this piece has got the most beautiful rouleau decoration and the little leaf trimmings um, on the on the little um, shoulder epaulettes and the collar. And this piece is about to be um, going on display in an exhibition which opens next weekend actually at the museum if any of you are nearby. Um, and it did also feature quite prominently, it was quite a, a similar copy to this in uh, the recent Emma film, if you look out for that. Um, I, um, Alexandra Byrne, the designer, came to have a look at our pieces and she, she lifted this one for Emma, but we don't mind, it looked wonderful. Um, just a little bit of menswear. We've got a man's um, coat from about 1837, 1840, which is beautifully tailored um, and just right down to the little chamfered edges on the, on the cuffs and the beautiful, the beautiful button stand and, and the, just it's beautiful coat. Um, and it's it's got the lovely padding stitches in it and the collar and the padding to make him look more manly when he's walking around in his coat. Um, moving forward, we've got a lovely dinner dress, um, which is a relatively recent acquisition. Um, and it came from a collector called Sheila Lovett Turner, who um, her estate very kindly passed pieces on to us when she passed away. And um, I think this is just a really rare and beautiful example of a more muted evening gown um, from the 1830s, 1837 to 1839 sort of period. That also, actually, that one is also on display at the moment in our Blooming Marvellous Fashion, Flowers in Fashion exhibition, which is currently open at the museum. Another shameless plug, as is this piece, um, which is a man's waistcoat um, from about 1840 to 1845, which is beautiful voided velvet and really stunning, um, lovely, lovely example. Moving forward into the 1860s, we've got a piece which was originally part of the Castle Howard collection. And when that was all sold off, um, our collection purchased a few items. Um, and this is a really typical example of a sort of crinoline piece from the 18, early 1860s, um, especially the, the black trimming, which um, I think is very much influenced by the advent of portrait photography and um, making yourself stand out in, in a photograph. Um, then we have a beautiful wedding gown with loads of ruching and draping and all sorts of um, detail, really, really tiny waist. Well, it looks tiny. It's not as tiny as it looks, actually. It's about um, 24 inches, but the way that they've um, shaped the, the, the waist with, with a corset, obviously, makes it look a lot smaller. And um, you've got just everything thrown at this, very typical of the 1880s, early 1880s. And then I just wanted to finish up with a really beautiful gown um, by Worth. House of Worth, which again came to us from the Sheila Lovett Turner ex um, collection. And um, this piece is really, really special. And we didn't have, this is an example of us adding uh, some beautiful couture to the collection from the 19th century. It dates to about 1897. Um, and in fact, it is one of the pieces that has a date stamp on it. That was the only year where Worth dated um, their pieces in the 19th century which makes it special in itself. It came to us um, without a back panel. So we have had to add a piece you can see in the image um, at the back. Um, 
it was obviously used for something else, but it's still a remarkable piece and um, we're really pleased to have it in the collection. So that's just a little taster of what we have in, um, in the collection at Chertsey, but it's by no means, it's just scratching the surface really. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, if any of our attendees today uh, would like to come to Chertsey and have a look at any of the pieces, what's the best way for them to go about it? And importantly, are you taking researchers in at the moment to have a look at the garments? Yes, in fact, um, we have been accepting, despite other people locking down, um, apart from when we were properly closed to the public, we did let people come and research pieces all the way through really. So ever since we've been open, we ha have been accepting researchers. And that's been great because we've been able to help people who haven't been going elsewhere. Mm. Um, I've just felt it's really important for people to still have access and we can do it in a socially distanced way. Um, and we can still let people see garments. So if you want to come and see pieces for research, you need to send an email to dress at churchymuseum.org.uk. Um, I could put that in the chat if that's Brilliant. helpful in a moment. Be yeah. So um, um, and you, may, you may have said this, and I may have just not caught it. Um, what's the collecting remit of Chertsey? Um, so it's British fashionable dress. Um, so that means that it's not just items that are made in Britain, but worn in Britain. Uh, so that does incorporate American designers and French designers and um, items from other parts of the world but we don't really collect um, ethnic clothing from other cultures and um, we don't really collect uh, more kind of folk folk dress or working dress although that is a fascinating thing and would be wonderful as well um, that's not a you know traditionally been our remit our collecting policy mm. is more fashionable dress yeah and also we, we do focus on items that are of lots of detail and, and beautifully worked and because that sort of fits in with Olive Matthews original interests. Mm. Yeah, and that worth example is, is a fantastic example of that. Yeah, yeah, we were very, very pleased to um, have that. That was a donation, which is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I will now pass back to Veronica for closing comments and uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to mainly use this time to echo what Hannah has said in thanking our speakers because we've had such um, a wealth of wonderful things shown to us and shared with us today. Um, I've put some links to the forthcoming exhibition at Chertsey um, in the chat and the website in the chat. Um, I can vouch for the fact that it's amazing, an amazing collection and I was so privileged to spend some time working with it. I can also say that it's one of the few collections in the UK at the moment that isn't moving, closed or otherwise, and, and within distance of um, the South, in London, you can get to it from London. Um, so I don't want to inundate Grace with visitors, but um, the, the quality of the pieces and the range of pieces in there really is, is amazing. So do have it on your radar. You've got Henfield, you've got Chertsey, and there'll be more to come. We are looking forward to hearing further Museum Five Minutes as we go forward. But to draw things to a close, um, I'm going to, um, Thank you all for attending today. Thank our speakers again for their papers. Um, speakers, I will share the chat with you afterwards so you can capture anything you might have missed in all the excitement. Um, we do have another at home coming on the 28th of November when Lynn will be hosting. Um, and we'll be sort of having a theme of collections and collecting. And we've got three wonderful speakers lined up. We'll be announcing details of that soon. I won't tell you full details yet because I want to confirm with Lynn that I'm saying the right names. And I think it's better, better to be safe than sorry. So full details to follow. Um, today's presentation has been recorded and we will be uploading them to our YouTube account. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, do feel free to get in touch with us at the Gmail address. And I will share that slide now, whilst I remember with our contact details. Um, I'd also encourage anyone who's wondering if they should give a paper, could give a paper, might give a paper to get in touch. We are always open to ideas, regardless of your background. You know, Lauren was apologizing for coming from a making perspective. You can see the love for that in the room here. We are open to everything and anything. So please stay in touch, keep coming throw ideas at us and we hope you've enjoyed today. Um, we're gonna let you go now to your afternoon, your evening or whatever is ahead of you, but 
we hope you've enjoyed today's at home as much as we have. And thank you again to our speakers. I'm going to react with a clap.